Alex, I really enjoy the fact that I joked about you being replaced on the, I guess, first official show, which was last Friday with uh, David S. Uh, Gallant, uh, and some people took that really seriously. Some people thought I'd actually made an executive decision to boot you off the show. And see, and this is why people took me seriously. <laughs> it would be the right move at this point, probably the prudent move. <laughs> Welcome back. You are back. Uh, well, a week ago you would have been back in America, but now you are in the back of the land of the living. Yes. It sounds like you've spent a week uh, in a particular kind of jet lag hell. Yeah, it's uh, comatose is perhaps the best way to describe it. Uh, you know, it's 13-hour time difference, so it's basically the literal reverse of time uh, oh, wow. in, in Shanghai where I was. So, you know, I got back and was having these little things where it's like, oh, cool, I'm sleeping for like three hours one night, and then the next night I slept for 15 straight without waking up once, and uh, that that is unsettling, if that has ever happened to you. Uh, that is that is not, I mean, I, I can sleep, I like uh -huh. sleep, but that is that is too much. That is way too much sleep. What, I think Jeff Gerson might disagree, um, what did you do when you got there, then? Because you, you have the same problem, right? Or did you land, and the way the time works out, it was... Was it the day? Like, how did it, it was, how did work out? It was daytime when we got there. It was, like, late afternoon, early evening, and then we got to the airport, or I got to the hotel. You know, it, it had gotten dark by that point. Uh, the way it worked, that I managed to, to switch myself pretty easily that way because... You just said it lasted a couple hours. Yeah, I just stayed up. Basically, okay. I just stayed up through the entire uh, series of plane rides uh, to Tokyo and then to eventually to Shanghai, and that eventually got me to a semi-normal schedule the week I was there. But going back, I just, for some reason, the whole thing just fell apart, and I, <laughs> I, I became mush. I was basically mush this entire past week. If you don't, if you don't do it the first day, you're pretty much a lost cause. Uh, yeah. At least that's been my experience. Is like The first day of traveling, or the day that you travel... Is is a hellish day, especially if you're doing a you know a trip like the one you just did, where you've got connecting airports in several international destinations. And by the time you get back, you've been through so much hell. You know, adding on another six hours of just trying to stay up isn't that crazy. But if you don't do it that first day, like having the will to do that once you're back in like your own apartment and in a you know your your own comfortable area, I imagine that's really difficult. When I got back to my apartment, I tore the clothes from my body, <laughs> Andy Dufresne style. I jumped in the shower to wash the like 30 hours of airplane and airport off of me, and then I just slept. I just slept for as long as I could, and it totally broke me, but it didn't matter because, my God, that was the best sleep I've ever had in my life. <laughs> so what, what is, I mean, not to go too off uh, video gamey, but but you obviously probably haven't played too many, but what is what is China like? Like, what is, China. does China care? No. No, it does not. <laughs> not even a little bit. It, the, the China Don't Care, I discovered, is not just a, a fun, jokey thing. China Don't Care is an ethos. Okay. It's, it is a guiding principle of, the, of, of a culture, or at least, you know, the culture I encountered while in Shanghai and various surrounding areas. Um, it was, you know, it, it was a really crazy, surreal trip for a lot of different reasons. Um, just, I mean, the, the, the craziest shit happened right up front, because... Okay. I mean, just to be totally upfront with why I was there, why we were going, my girlfriend's mother passed away uh, early in December. My girlfriend. And so she, uh, th the timing could not have been crazier because we had to try and book a trip to Shanghai during the holidays, like two weeks before we were actually going to fly out there. And there were not many flights left, so we, we took what we could. Um, but when we got there, we had to go to the funeral literally the day after we flew in. So, oh man! And it was in not in Shanghai. It was in this this tiny town or you know tiny relative to say the you know few million people who live in Shanghai uh, called Ningbo, which is like two hours outside of the city. Okay. So we had to meet up with with my girlfriend's father who lives in Hong Kong and her cousin uh, who lives in Shanghai. We all got on a train, took two hour train out to Ningbo, uh, got there. Got in a cab. Cab driver had no idea where the the burial plot or the 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 any of that stuff was. Uh, so her father decided that we should get out on the side of the road in the middle of absolutely fucking nowhere, uh, while he calls this cousin to come pick us up, take us to this place to do mm -hmm. the funeral thing. 
we wait, were waiting on the side of the road with, like, just, you know, like, maybe three cars total drove by the entire time. We were out on this, like, giant, like, nine-lane road. Uh, eventually, he shows up, drives us over there. We get there, and we find out we cannot actually do the funeral ceremony uh, because it is too late in the day. Oh, my God. <laughs> Local tradition uh, apparently dictated that uh, burials or, you know, any sort of the funeral procession must take place, I guess, very early in the morning there. Uh, wow. And no one uh, communicated that to anyone that, you know, from our, our cadre of people. So the so whole the funeral thing, was canceled? Not not exactly. It was never, it was a very small ceremony to okay. begin with. Like, it, right. was, it was meant to be a very small, intimate thing, like sure. a couple of. Uh, her mother's friends and like us, and that was pretty much it. Okay, all right. Um, you know, so we, it was not like a big uh, to do, but at the same time, there was no communication whatsoever about what was oh, actually man. supposed to take place during this. Oh, so man. we get there. There's a lot of Chinese arguing that I don't understand. Uh, <laughs> Just imagining they, you, specifically you, but I don't know what it is about you in China and a bunch of people just arguing around you, and it's just. That's just that's just funny right up front. I didn't get acknowledged very much during any of this, <laughs> which I I totally understand why because I mean no one there spoke English. Uh, you know, once you get, in Shanghai, there's a good chance someone will understand a few of the English words you're saying outside. Once you get inside outside the city, there's no chance. So you just right. don't even try. Um, when I did get acknowledged, it was usually with a look that just said, how the fuck did you get here? <laughs> it was always the same look of just like. Hmm. How? Why? Like where, where's Waldo? Where's Alex? Yeah. What am I doing there? Um. So, you know, we got there. It, it, they they argued for a while, and they eventually decided they were going to do like a, a sort of you know series of prayers, and then we would go up to where the burial plot is, so we uh -huh. could you know kind of sit there and make our peace. And then the next morning, they would do the official thing with the monk, and he would bury the ashes and all that stuff. And uh, we did not have to stay for that, but. The series of events leading up to this, I, I don't... It, it, it was all very weird because, you know, we we didn't get to go, like, say, to, to, to Ryan's funeral this right. last year. And that was something that was a point of contention for a lot of us. And that was something that I was always kind of lamenting about. Like, I didn't get to go to that. I didn't get to have that closure with people. Watching this unfold where, like, her <laughs> mother's friend, be... literally, like 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 a light switch... The second they decided they were going to do the, the prayers and stuff, she just jumps, drops to the ground, starts wailing and sobbing, and oh, then man. 60 seconds later just turns it right off. I, I had no, like, watching these dudes just standing around smoking the whole time while, you know, they are going through these presumably religious processions and, and, and situations made me kind of realize that, you know what, this is all, it doesn't, this is not necessary. You don't necessarily get closure from things like this unless <laughs> you find ways on your own to find that closure. So I sat there the whole time, just kind of sitting there thinking about the absurdity of all, and just going, you know what? This I, I am witnessing an amazing thing here. I should just appreciate it for what it is, and that is that. Like my girlfriend, the whole time is just like, I don't even know what's happening. I don't know what's going on. Here. Okay, at least at least at least you're not on your own there in sort no. of the reaction. Uh, stuff, man. That is, that's an, that's an intense first twenty four hours to a trip. Like, did you, did did you get to enjoy the trip at all? Because you were there for a week, so you must have had at least some time to, like, like I don't, I don't to enjoy China. Yeah, I mean, once they they took us to the empty Ningbo bus station, which we waited around for a while to take us back to the train station to take us back home. Uh, the rest of the trip was genuinely very interesting, uh, sometimes kind of crazy and absurd, but for the most part, like, us spending time with my girlfriend's family, them taking us to, like, genuinely, like, spectacular restaurants, like, you know, just actually doing things in the city, mostly with her family, occasionally on her own, um, and it was pretty awesome. Like, Shanghai is, is genuinely a, a pretty rad city. It's bizarre in the sense that there is almost nothing old left there. Uh, the majority of the, the older buildings have either been revamped for, uh, you know, modern stores and shops and what have you, or they've just been bulldozed entirely. Uh, so it's this weird thing where the one kind of old thing I got to see was her grandmother's house, which is one of the last remaining apartment buildings in Shanghai from, like, the late 1940s when it was built and it's been des designated, like, a historical zone. 
so they can't, you know, bull, like bulldoze it over and turn it into condos. Uh, but the rest of the time, you know, you're just kind of going around all these different, like, shopping malls and, you know, huge, like, modern structures and stuff. Like, you know, even it, what is there that is still old is not particularly well taken care of, save for a few, like, specific historical landmarks. So it's a very strange place to kind of go around and take a look at compared to, like, you know, other major cities that, you know, obviously tend to, you know, treat their their historical elements as, like, big tourist destination type deals. But... Did you, yeah. have, to deal with, did you have to deal with the smog? It wasn't that bad while I was there. There were, like, two <laughs> days when it was genuinely, like, you could taste it. It was is, really bad. I was say, is that just reflective of how dark your heart already is? And so that's, the smog just couldn't penetrate it? That's probably part of it, at least. <laughs> um... So I'll tell you about that, two two of the, the 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 funnier, more bizarre things that I did on the trip. Okay, uh, please. These are like the only two things we really kind of did on our own, too, like away from family and everything. All right. Uh, the first thing we did one night was go to this place called Mister X. Uh, Mister X is a, you know how you go to a place like say like a laser tag place or something like that where you know you and a bunch of people kind of get thrown into a room and you run around and play whatever you know yeah. dumb game they've set up for you. Okay, this is like that if you, if instead of laser tag it was like like a very non bloody saw. Um, they have set up these different rooms, these different areas, mm -hmm. uh, and each area is you know like a locked room that you have to find your way out of. Oh, and okay, all right. These you, these are just start, there. There's one actually of these. Uh, they're called escape rooms, right? Yes. Yeah. So th this is people might have heard of these because they're just starting to kind of. Come out. The, the companies that organize them in Asia, they started, I think, in Japan, have just started to bring them. There's one in San Francisco, yeah. um, and I think there might be one in New York, or at least there was one in New York. So anyway, people might know them as escape rooms, but yeah. continue. So it's, the, it's, it's that idea. And so, you know, you're, you're locked in this room. You have only these very uh, vague, mm, you know, visual clues to, to kind of start you off. We ended up in a, uh, a two-team room uh, where it was my girlfriend and I in one room and this uh, college girl and, like, her little niece and two, you know, nephews in the other room, uh, the kids of which spoke better English than, than the college students. So they were actually yelling things back at us like, are you okay? Did you find it? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so for, like, half an hour, like, fumbling around this room, the two of us, like, trying to find the first key or whatever... Then we finally get the first piece. Like we had to like throw a rope out for them to tie a key to to give back to us in our room. Oh wow, uh, that's really cool. Opened a, a hidden passage underneath the sink, which then led to another room behind it that had uh, like a pulley and like a hook that you could use that would actually pull back the wall and reveal this whole other thing. And then there was like a weird trap passage, and there was like a cage door with a bunch of TV monitors and like a lockbox. It was really elaborate. I was surprised. They only give you about an hour to get out of the space, so we did not end up getting out of the space in that time due to language barrier and other things. But mm. there were like, it was really insane. Like the the amount of detail they put into the different rooms and the things you could actually like physically do to 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 manipulate the rooms and stuff. Like that's the sort of thing that you would have to sign a lot of waivers in the U.S. To, to, to be able to operate a business like that. I think in China, it's probably not such a big deal. But <laughs> there were, like, I mean, these like, big heavy metal objects we're using to, like, pry open things and, you know, turn, like, we're moving entire false walls. And it's, like, it was really crazy. I was, I, 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 I you say it's, there's one of those in New York. I had never heard of those in the U.S. anywhere up to that point. That was my first experience with anything like that. It might just be San Francisco. It might just be San Francisco, which would make sense that something like that would debut in, in San Francisco. But, um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't done it. I, I had meant to do it before I left, um, but it's proven pretty popular, so my guess is it'll, it'll kind of spread around. But I don't think you have to do, I don't think you do anything with heavy objects in, yeah. The, I haven't read anything about the one in San Francisco, assuming that I might do it someday, and I don't want it spoiled for me. But you know, I think you know there there are you know moments where like you know you're you know there are trap doors found underneath you know furniture and things like that. But yeah, uh, I don't I don't know if it's as elaborate uh, or as <laughs> mildly dangerous as uh, the one that you actually encountered. Yeah, it, it was. It sounds I mean, really cool though. Yeah, the danger level was definitely pretty low. It was just like you would, pro you might accidentally drop a wrench on your hand or your foot or something. It's just a or, little you know. more than we're, you know, in the U.S. We're, you know, yeah. they're, you know, a little more safe around the edges than than say uh, where you might be used to abroad. 
It definitely had a real. I mean, I was surprised at how elaborate the rooms were. I feel like if we knew, we got someone we knew who was a really good like puzzle game designer to 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 design something like this. Like you and I, we probably make a few million dollars. You know, we could make a lot of money doing this. <laughs> we want to, you know, we got some friends. We should probably, you know, exploit this. That's somehow. true. Yeah, yeah. Get Alexander Bruce to uh, design an escape room. Yeah, dude, that'd be awesome. But it was it was really fun. You wouldn't, es- you wouldn't escape it. You'd have to take like an LSD tablet to make it out. Yeah. I, I, I really liked it. I thought that was super fun. I, I would love to see someone in the U.S. try something that elaborate and crazy, uh, especially someone with some, some real game design skills, because the rooms we were in, like, the, the, the solutions were a little bit... Uh, not, 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 it took some real effort to, to get past the opening uh, jump points to, like, start opening things up and getting through there, and you kind of have to yell and wave your arms at a camera to get any hints or any sort of help with that stuff, so it was not... Mm-hmm. It was it was a little a little obtuse in places, but I, I really liked the idea of it. The other thing we did, uh, which I don't know why we decided we were going to do this. I'm not. Uh... So we went to a, a place. Uh, I like. Chain... I, I really like the fact that you're sighing before you tell this story. Yeah, it's, it's the it, it's, it's the the strangest thing. So we went to this place called Chengju, which is about an hour outside Shanghai. Uh, as far as I can tell, the town's primary uh, industry is theme parks. Uh, there are a lot of theme parks in the surrounding area around Changzhou, and the one we chose to go to was a place called World Joyland. The reason we went to World Joyland is because it is a massive, something like 68,000 square foot uh, theme park that is almost exclusively predicated on the notion of copyright violations. <laughs> uh, specifically, uh, copyright violations of Activision Blizzard trademarks. Uh, mostly World of Warcraft and StarCraft. Uh, so if you look this place up on the internet, uh, I'll, I'll link to a, a, a photo album my girlfriend did uh, of, of the, the place when we were there. Uh, World Joyland, basically, like, it, it's not themed exactly on anything related to World of Warcraft or StarCraft. It just lifts a bunch of art and, like, design assets from those games and then repurposes them as displays within the park alongside a bunch of other weird, like, cartoon stuff. Uh, the main mascot of the place is the Angry Dog, which you might be... It, it, maybe surprisingly looks a little bit like an angry bird. I don't know. <laughs> so, you know I, was trying, I was wondering... Okay, all right. Yeah, where you're going with it. It's um, it is a strange, bewildering place that is humongous, and somehow, not through any effort of our own, we ended up on a day where they were only running at half staff, and there were maybe sixty people total in the park. It, but like, how how big is this park relative to you know like a Great America or something like that? that people Comparable. Might... If not so it's, larger it's, in some respects. So it's big and it's empty. It is empty. a big fucking place, and there are you know there's like a giant you know uh, one of those 360 you know like uh, movie type things where you know you're on one of those like moving chairs while it's like you're zooming through all this different you know amazing scenery that's also kind of out of focus, but no one told anyone about that, so that that <laughs> that was pretty bad. There are rides like there's you know there's a space mountain equivalent. There are roller coasters. Nobody was going on them, even though they were open. Uh, so you, if you wanted to go on these roller coasters, you could be like, "Hey, I want to go on the back." Like, yeah, you could. You there, could. Man, that sounds there, like a dream. I also there just was don't no trust one the, there. But I just don't trust. I don't know if I trust the safety regulations on that stuff. N- nor should you. Uh, it, the, the rides, I mean, all looked pretty new and in good condition, and they were still building, you know, large chunks of the park out. I mean, there was a whole theater that we didn't even go to that just said eSports Exhibition, which I would have loved to have gone to, but it was closed. So oh, I, I man, that's, that's a bummer. But, yeah, it was the weirdest experience, because on top of, like, again, huge, uh, giant sections of the park literally just taking art from video games that I recognize and, you know not selling merchandise based on that, which I assume is how they get around that. Uh, There was, again, no one there. So they were running, like, their stage shows for, like, four people standing around kind of half paying attention while they do, like, these, you know, weapons acrobatic shows for nobody. Uh, And I don't think the park is always like that. Like, I got the impression this was just a particularly off day. But... 
you know, you've seen all these things about how China is, like, in rapid development, and there are, like, you know, large towns that are basically being constructed out of no actual demand to speak of at this moment, like, tons of, you know, apartment towers being built that are just, like, empty right now. And being, walking through this just humongous <laughs> millions and millions of dollars investment with nobody there to in any way appreciate any aspect of its just straight up jankiness uh, was maybe the weirdest thing that happened to me outside of, of the whole funeral situation while I was there. Like it was just the strangest thing. That's that's weird. I'm looking at some some folks in the chat uh, linked to a uh, a gallery of photos uh, from it, and uh, like even the statues aren't even that great. No, like they're really half-assed statues. Uh, yeah. To boot. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a, a lot of it's really half-assed, which is why I didn't really go on any of the major rides because I kind of didn't trust it. But like, it's, what a what a worthwhile place to have gone to to see and to do and to say you've been there. Though I mean, it reminds like the story starts out promising because it reminds me of you know I feel like a lot of kids in high school had this experience of like you have the high school physics class that goes to Great America during the day. And you have to take. We had to take a test at the end of it, you know, and run like physics experiments, you know, yeah. like gravity and stuff during the. But you got to go to Great America like on a Tuesday at 10 a.m. and there was nobody there, which means you get your run of the park all day long, and it was awesome. Yeah. Um, but uh, this sounds this sounds slightly. This tough. is like the opposite of that, where it's <laughs> like you get to go, and yeah, I could go do all that stuff, but man, I really didn't want to. Uh, and it wasn't like super expensive to get in either. It was like you know thirty five dollars or something for a ticket, uh, like actual American money. Right. And you know it was worth it just to just to go the hell out there and see this absurd, just this just absolutely pointless endeavor. Uh, you know this this giant amusement park that nobody seemed to be particularly enjoying. Uh, I'm sure there are families that go there and have fun. You know <laughs> when there's more people around, I guess, but. Seeing everyone there, just who was there, just seemed kind of seeming kind of indifferent to the whole thing, and you know, even the kids kind of walking around, going, "Why is no one here? What's happening?" It was pretty amazing. Man, well, that's that is a whirlwind trip. That is yeah. that is. Uh, I can't think of many reasons to want to go to China. Uh, so you need a reason. You need fact, a good reason. The fact that that you actually you know got a chance to sort of like mark that off of a. Not really a bucket list, but now it is on there, and you get to checkbox it. Yeah, and you know, I, I might end up there again someday, but uh, probably not for the, for the foreseeable future. But right. Honestly, like most of the time I spent in Shanghai, I really liked it. It's 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 a cool city. There's a surprising, you know, there's a lot to do there. Uh, there's you know, it's it's fascinating to watch it just, like, kind of develop itself culturally, because, I mean, there's still a lot of weird conflict there, you know, people still protesting the amount of insane development going on uh, as much as they can. Like, well, I mean, and, uh, through... con consoles just got approved uh, to be sold uh, in China, yeah. which is uh, a potentially huge development uh, in terms of uh, the expansion of the, the now current gen, which is, I'm still... I feel like it's going to take me uh, as long to switch to saying current gen instead of next gen as it is going to, <laughs> or longer than it's going to take me to remember to write 2014 instead of 2013, uh, because it's been so long that we've been talking about it. But that's a, that's a huge development over there, and I, I in some ways wonder if the reason that Blizzard doesn't, or I guess Activision Blizzard doesn't care about that theme park is because uh, if you listen to Activision investment calls, you know one of the first things they're always asking about is what are you doing to make further inroads in China? And so, you know, probably not at the top of their concerns is pestering the Chinese government to clamp down on copyright concerns with this theme park when they're more interested in getting their games uh, sold uh, over there because uh, in Asia there are, uh, there are often restrictions on how long people can play MMOs and, and, and things of that nature uh, that have made it more difficult for uh, some of those games to, to kind of make inroads there. Now, I'm not going to say it was all me, but I'm just, you know, mm -hmm. while I'm in China, suddenly consoles are allowed, you know, I maybe had a little conversation with the Ministry of Culture. Are you the Dennis, the Dennis Rodman of China? Uh, of video games in China, yes. That is, that I'm going to play claim to that right now. Uh, I don't have any good drunken rants, unfortunately, prepared for this, so, <laughs> but, uh... Uh... Well, that's great. They, did, you, did, you, did you play any games while you were on, like, these big flights, or... 
Did Not really. I watched a lot of movies mostly. Uh, I played some more Zelda. Uh, I bought my uh, my girlfriend a 3DS XL finally for Christmas, so uh, we, we traded that back and forth a little bit. Uh, and I played some more Zelda, but other than that, no. I mostly just stayed away from video games and just tried to kind of soak in as much of you know what was around me while I was there as I could. Uh, and I'm glad I did that because I you know I'm definitely one of those people that can kind of you know bury my face in my phone uh, wherever I end up going and kind of end up missing things while while I'm there, I think having to sort of, you know, kind of uh, engage my girlfriend's family and sort of, you know, try to make an impression and, you know, actually uh, pay attention to what was going on while I was there <laughs> right. helped a lot. Uh, because it was, because honestly, I had a great time. I really, I really liked Shanghai a lot. And, you know, I mean, someone mentioned in the chat, to, to your point, there are reasons to go to China. They have things that you can go see there. There is a culture there that is... Oh, sure. No, I did not mean to disparage yeah. China as much as that as a reflection of the fact that I, I have not been to a whole lot of worldly places, and it's just yeah. not in my personal, you know, top ten. You know, I'd, I'd much rather... You know, I've really never been to Europe, so, you know, I yeah. kind of... <laughs> I and think, I would think that somewhere think like Beijing Paris is, would be... The yeah, first place go, you would go. Yeah, I think going to Paris is probably an easier sell uh, to yeah. my wife uh, in terms of uh, spending money on a vacation. So, uh, yeah, like I would like to see China eventually, but I also don't think like it's going anywhere, and it will probably only get further developed and more appealing as time goes on. Uh, so uh, the one thing I will say it is line. really crazy how westernized uh, even places like mainland China are becoming. Because like I've been to Hong Kong before, but that was a colony, you know, for or, or you know a British property for many many years. So like the fact that you go there and there's like signs in English and everyone speaks a little English is uh, not terribly surprising. Is but it even, like is it like Tokyo where or you know a lot of you know highly metropolitan uh, areas of of Japan where like Western culture is very hip. And thus, that's you get the sense that that's a lot of the reason uh, that you know you can speak English and kind of get away with it, or at least you know some broken English and get away with it. I didn't get the impression it was really a a hip thing so much as it was the Chinese government really wanting its people to master uh, as much of Western culture as they can so they can uh, dominate and destroy it. <laughs> uh, but I mean, honestly, like the last time my girlfriend was in Shanghai was six years ago. Since then, they have added like a huge swath of, of subway trains. They have revamped a lot of the the, the public transportation stuff there, and it, a lot of it isn't like straight up. They say it in Mandarin, and then they say it in English. The, like all the signs are in English. Like hmm. all the major like city-run government stuff has stuff in English, which you wouldn't think would be really necessary. Because I'm going to be honest. Outside of Shanghai, I was the only white dude I ever saw. In Shanghai, I saw maybe a couple dozen walking around at various times who I always just assumed were there, you know, looking for wives or whatever. But, like, I, I there, there's really not a ton of expats there. There are some, but uh, it's, it's, it's a very small chunk of people. So you wouldn't, it, it's surprising that there's as much of the city dedicated to you, the dumb white guy, actually being able to understand things as it is. Uh, mm. I did not expect that in, in the slightest going into that. Do you other like in restaurants like you know in Japan, especially like in Tokyo, you you know you get like uh, menus and on like the front it's Japanese and then you flip it over and it's English because that's how many English people are coming through that city um, and also because it's it's hip in in Japan or at least you know centralized parts of Japan. Uh, did they have the equivalent there in in China or is it you just kind of have to like what is what is this? It really depends on the place. Uh, okay. You know, like the 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 more upscale, you know, money heavy restaurants definitely will will lean toward that. Uh, the more hole in the wall places, usually you're just pointing at a picture and just going that. Uh, and <laughs> end up That's not a dog, problem. right? That's not I, honestly, dog? I never ran into that. I, I never even saw a dog on a menu the entire time I was there. I asked, and I was like, "Is this is any of this like dog or cat or anything?" And they're like, "No, no, no, none of that." <laughs> Uh, and, but I mean, weird food? No, nothing too crazy. I ate frog a couple of times. Uh, I ate a few fish with the the head on, but I'm like super used to that at this point. Um, okay. But no, they're I mean, not not live fish. They were just dead fish with the head on. The only really weird eating experience I had there was when we were in Ningbo. Uh, they decided during in between the prayers and the actual walking up to the uh, the burial plot, they decided that uh, we were going to go have lunch. And the we were far enough outside of the main city that uh, to find a restaurant in that area, you basically are going to someone's house uh, that is ostensibly a restaurant, but really is just a room with some a couple of tables that has no heat whatsoever. 
uh, and you go into the kitchen and just point the things you want them to make for you, uh, whatever the ingredients might be. You know, so they have some seafood, if they have some poultry, if they have you know a bunch of fresh vegetables, which they did. They were like growing it literally in the backyard of that restaurant. Hmm. Uh, so that was that was strange, just in the the way that you know I was not accustomed to ordering food that way. But honestly, I I ate maybe one not great meal the entire time I was there, and that was just at some like you know kind of crummy family restaurant in suburban Shanghai. Like the rest of the time, I ate insanely well, and I could not have been more pleasantly surprised by that fact. Like the food, top to bottom, was pretty much spectacular. Man, well, you know, obviously not. Uh... Most pleasant reason to go on a trip like that, um, but it sounds it sounds like you know outside of that, you, it sounds yeah. like that was actually a sounds like a pretty good trip. Yeah, other than you know a few kind of dark, darkly I'm not going to say comic, but certainly strange moments. Mm. Uh, it was it was a really crazy. I, again, I'm I'm reluctant to say fun because of the reason we were going there, but I definitely I get, was able I get to what enjoy. You mean. Yeah, I, I was able to enjoy mean. and appreciate uh, the, the the time I spent there. So, but at the same time. I'm glad to be back. I'm glad the show's back. I'm glad I'm just back into the routine. It's it's nice to be back. Um, while you were gone, I got really into Spelunky and Dark Souls. Yeah, I noticed that. I noticed <laughs> you're doing a lot of that now. I went, I, went that da- I went down into my own my own dark place. Uh, I'm playing Spelunky every day. I'm playing Dark Souls at night. Uh, it's actually been super great. I I decided to take, you know, we're about to starting this week get into game releases like that it's actually this week is the banner saga which is a right. uh kickstarted um strategy game that looks pretty spectacular um has music done by austin wintery who did the music to journey um and uh nidhogg which is another one of the uh nidhogg is a famous game in the indie community because it's been around and showing up at places for years uh with no indication of when it would come out and then it was just magically announced a couple of weeks ago and uh, comes out today. Um, hmm. I cashed in a code, but I have not checked it out yet. But it does have online play, so that may be something that uh, that you and I have to, to check out, um, separate from uh, the guys in San Francisco doing doing their own stuff, because it's supposed to be incredible. I am into this. Uh, it's a one-on-one sword fighting game for Ooh. people who are not aware. Um but yeah, I, I've gotten really into. Uh, it looks like I'm about halfway through Dark Souls when I looked okay. at a fact. Um, how, how are and, you finding it? How how is it? How is it generally revving you? Man, it's I, the difficulty is is exaggerated and overrated. Um, I'm not not saying it is an easy game at all. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not trying to take away from a lot of the mystique of that game. It but is also, a challenging I, game. But I also mean to take away from the mystique of that game in that I think it is uh, the the myth the mythology of Dark Souls presents that game as an insurmountable gaming challenge when when it's really just... It's a very specific type of game that harkens back to a very specific time and game design uh, that it feels fresh now because it's just not around anymore. Uh, but it's a game that... And playing it alongside Splunky uh, has been extremely rewarding because uh, they are they kind of pluck from the same source in, in that uh, the way the games uh, respect the player's patience and understanding of the mechanics and the design. Like, everything that happens in Splunky is black and white. It happens for a reason. When the player dies, it's your own fault. Uh, and that's the same in Dark Souls. So it's been rewarding to play both of them side by side because uh, it's sort of my the, the own patience that I have in one game is being rewarded in the other game uh, as well. Um, and it's not to say either game is easy because they absolutely are not, um, but... They're very interesting games, and they've. It's been satisfying to sort of have the mystique around them kind of brought down a little bit, and and sort of just understand them as as games as opposed to a thing that other people talk about. Um, people in the chat are saying that you're only a third of the way through. Patrick, are you bullshitting me? Is this well, all I guess bullshit? It, it's it's hard to say, right? Like parts of the game are optional. Um, it depends if they're including the DLC. Sure. Um, so well, either way, I'm a significant chunk through the game um, that I'm 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 pretty happy about. Um, but yeah, yes, yeah, as Paradactyl mentions, 25% if you're playing the DLC because the DLC adds about 25% to the game. So we'll, I, I've heard the DLC is really good. I I couldn't tell Vinny was being sarcastic, saying like you really need to check it out. It's my favorite part of the game, uh, which makes makes it sound like he's just being an asshole, probably, um, and that I don't need to check that out. But I probably will. If I'm only going to play this game once, 
Uh, I might as well see as much of it as I can. But uh, it's also helped that you know I'm playing this game and I've been very careful uh, to not look up as much as I can. But I'm also not taking that as a hardline stance. Like I, I've mm -hmm. been I've been streaming when I play the the boss battles on my personal YouTube channel. Uh, which has been uh, enjoyable because when I get really frustrated, when I feel like I want to turn the game off, you know, there are people in the chat kind of giving me at least a tip on like, hey, maybe you want to try this strategy or maybe you want to do this. Um, so it's been nice because I've been able to figure things out for myself, but then I want to also run into walls. Uh, I've been able to uh, sort of, you know, kind of get some hints from folks that have already uh, played the game. At the same time, uh, Dark Souls players are the most backseat uh, players and fans of a game I have ever experienced because mm -hmm. if I showed you my email slash PM slash Tumblr stuff, it is just a list of do this, don't do this, and then another message that is completely contradictory to uh, what the last person told me. And people are so hardened in what they think is the right way to play that game, uh, which in some ways is humorous, and then in other ways I think is reflective of incredibly flexible, good game design. Sure. If you can have dozens and dozens of players that say this is the way to do it and the next person says no you don't have to do it that way you can do it this way uh, that seems like that reflects a game that uh, kind of is flexible for the players that are playing it so obviously you know this is a conversations people have had years ago but I, I you know whether I finished Dark Souls or not and now I think I will because uh, I've gotten this far I can probably see my way to the end um, it's been it's been really enjoyable, and uh, Spelunky is Spelunky is you know equally fun. Spelunky's awesome. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I got into it a little bit when it came out, but I definitely uh, did not did not actually get into it. You know, now that I've played it for a significant significant chunk of time, eh, the time that I put it into it the first time around didn't even count. I, I really sure. did not see anything that game truly had to offer, um, and and now I am, and man, it is a it's just a damn good game. And it's just it's very age traditional in terms of the games I enjoy because usually I play games that have a beginning, middle, and an end. And there are you know instances where Spelunky ends. Like there are right. credits that roll, but it's not really an end. It's not it's about like, that. It's more it's well, and it's also more you have to think about that as like you finished one way to 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 finish that game. Right. You know, there is hell. There are other ways to, to, to seek more parts of that game that uh, go beyond just defeating Olmec, who is the sort of mainline first boss that you can encounter. And, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I've, I've gone down a deep rabbit hole. Uh, we'll see how long I can hold on to both of those now that other games are coming out. And I really do want to play the Banner Saga because it seems like I'm on a play one strategy game a year thing. Sure. It's common in, in uh, 2012. It was Fire Emblem in 2013, and it might be Banner Saga in 2014. Uh, so uh, we'll see how long I can hold on to both of those games. But uh, I am I'm buoyed by the fact that uh, my wife has gone for significant chunks of this month on work mm. trips, so I'm able to spend my evenings uh, playing uh, playing those games. But yeah, I don't know. It's been it's been dark. These these games don't make you feel good. But no, they no, they're not intended feel, to. But they also make you feel really good when you pull off really crazy things. So it's sure. uh. There are games of highs and lows, extreme highs and extreme lows. So yeah, I saw you uh, buy, all, spend all that money, and then just go jump on spikes. That was that was pretty spectacular. That was one of the. I, I haven't gotten to watch much of your stuff live, but I did manage to catch that one. That was a that was a good moment. Yeah, I'm trying to. Um, I'm in the process of now that uh, the weather has thawed in Chicago a bit. While you were gone, it was ridiculously cold. Oh, I heard. The, the Midwest was uh, in. Uh, you know, it got to. With wind chill uh, below 30, below 40 uh, for a couple of days, where it's just dangerous to go outside. Where if you were yeah. outside for more than uh, five minutes, you could legitimately get frostbite. So I, I kind of was staying inside, even though after the Christmas break, I was trying to transition to going into the Cards Against Humanity office. Um, so I'm trying to figure out a way to start doing my Spelunky runs from uh, their office, but it requires me investing in some equipment to make that happen. Uh, there's mm. a PlayStation 3 at their office, uh, which also has the daily challenges bleh, challenges mm. uh, that are in the PC version. Uh, the seeding of those daily challenges, which is to say the randomly generated level, is different in the different versions of the game. Um, 
but I would like to do from there, but it requires me at the... I got this this company called Avermedia made this Extreme Cap U3, which is a uh, sort of capture box, but it only and they were they just one just showed up at my doorstep and but it only runs on USB 3.0, which is not in my MacBook Air, which means mm-hmm. I can't use it on my MacBook Air, which is what I would bring to the Cards Against Humanity office. So I think I might need to investigate purchasing an Elgato, uh, which runs on USB 2.0. Uh, and then I could do that uh, remotely. And then I also need to install Windows on my laptop. And yeah, there's some... got a lot to do. Yeah, but I would like to get in that place because uh, uh, Max Temkin is uh, also a Spelunky fiend, and uh, Greg Woland, who is a artist and designer, uh, works out of that office, and he's also a Spelunky fiend. So it'd be nice to have some other people to mock me uh, when I do that. Uh, but uh, hopefully that'll happen this week. I think what I might do in the meantime is that I might push up when I do my Spelunky runs. I've been doing them at 1 p.m. Mm-hmm. But I think I might move that up to 11 and then have mm-hmm. those videos export to my Dropbox so that by the time I get to the office uh, I could uh, archive those uh, remotely and I could uh, I could get both those done here while I get that set up in, uh, in the office. But as people point out in the chat, uh, I won't get to compete with Chris Remo which has been Sort of my, I've been using that as my metric when things go wrong. Is as long as I beat Chris Remo, today was a success. Hashtag beat Remo. Beat Remo, that's amazing. I, uh, I probably should, uh, I probably shouldn't actually start picking up and playing that game again. I, I got, you know, I was hot into Spelunky for uh, several months after that thing came out on on PC or whatever originally or Xbox. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have never gotten into the daily challenges, really. I have never gotten super into, like, continued competitive Spelunky play over the time, even though I knew that stuff was, you know, something people would get into. It just, for me, it never clicked exactly. I don't know why that is. Like, I I really like that game a lot. I I remember enjoying it immensely when I was reviewing it, but then I fell off of it, and I just never wanted to get back on that horse again, and I'm not sure what's actually stopping me from doing that. I I think right now, Alex, is the the perfect time. Uh, A lot of Giant Bomb fans are playing. I'm playing. We're beating Chris Remo. Uh, Now is the perfect time, because the Jaylee Challenge is, you know, at most, you know a half hour of your time if you have a particularly good run, but otherwise yeah. it's usually about three minutes. Of That's a fair point. <laughs> yeah, it's, not, it's definitely not a time suck issue, because I mean, I can, I, 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 will, I will not pass many of those challenges, if any. Uh, I, I never beat that game. I've never gotten through to the end of that game. I don't know if I ever will. Uh, that was never really the point for me. The point was just, you know, just a, a, a test your metal to see how far you can get, to see what you can actually accomplish no matter how many times that game tries to fuck you, and that game will try to fuck you, man. Yeah, it's bad. It's bad. It's It's been rough, but, you know, again, like Dark Souls, it is a game that you need to be very... Like, when you die, Yeah. it's it's very easy to just hit uh, the quick restart button and just jump right into another one, but it's really important that when you die, you try and break down exactly why you died. Like, for example... Uh, the one, the, the death you alluded to, um, the last daily challenge where I jumped in the spikes, you know, what I needed to take away from that was, I mean, it was just a dumb move, and sometimes right. those happen. Sometimes you just make mistakes. But sure. what I was really doing was I, like a lot of players, overly rely on the run button because I've gotten very used to the uh, the dangers in the mines in the first area, and so I run a lot, and that I can kind of avoid most things with relative ease, because I just kind of have the, the strategy of the mines down, but that leads to me making way too many dumb mistakes, uh, like jumping on those spikes, where had I just walked through uh, and encountered the spikes, made a proper jump, or walked through the spikes and jumped up, I would have had absolutely no problem. Um, mm-hmm. and so, you know, the reflection on that death is, yes, it was just a dumb mistake, but no, hey dummy, stop running so much because it's not actually useful. Like, running is only something that you should be using in the most extreme of circumstances uh, or in a situation where, hey, I'm going to run through this so I can avoid this trap. Um, If you're just running because you're tired of getting through certain areas of a Spelunky over and over again, it's probably time to put the controller down because you're not actually encouraging yourself to go on a, a useful run. So Yeah. And I have a serious temper problem too. So especially when it comes to to uh, games that are a little more um, enervating uh, in their their difficulty. So yeah, I think that's really the biggest obstacle for me is just being willing to say, "All right, well, I did something dumb. 
I can either play again or just play again tomorrow instead of just slamming a controller into my desk over and over again and, you know, holding back muffled just just shrieks of rage. You know, like, I, I, need, to, I need to let that go. And that's why the daily challenge is really useful because, uh, and I've heard this strategy echoed from some other uh, players that are deep into Splunky, is that oftentimes you don't want to do more than one run a day. Uh, because you, what you start to do is you start to get into bad habits on subsequent runs, which are just to, you're getting frustrated. Right. Uh, so you start rushing through things. You start trying like you're getting greedy because you got to the caves and you don't, you you know you you have to earn your way back there again because you if you use the shortcuts, the shortcuts are only really useful to learn enemy patterns. You want the right. items you're going to earn in the earlier worlds, and uh, so if you only do it once a day you're probably not going to fall into those habits. So if you just kind of stick to the daily challenge, you know, you might uh, you might have a better a better shot at having uh, a superior run. So I will keep this in mind. I you know, I have it downloaded to my Vita. I have it I have it on like three different fucking platforms at this point. So there's no reason why I should The Vita version is the best version of that game. Uh, yeah. it has the, the D-pad on the Vita is fantastic. Um, I use the analog stick on the PC and 360 versions because I don't like the D-pad on my, my 360 no. pad. I don't have the silver upgraded Xbox controller. Um, so, anyway, uh, that's what I've been playing. But I am looking forward to playing Nidhogg, and, which Nidhogg sounds like a racial slur. I it does, a little bit. Every time I say it. And uh, Banner Saga, uh, which uh, I'm also looking forward to playing. So hopefully uh, I'll get some time to, to spend with both of those uh, later this week. Um I do also we, understand that um, Broken Age Episode 1 is going to be available for backers. For this backers, week. yeah. I imagine that will hit early access before the end of the month on Steam, uh, which is the plan for that, but backers get that early. So, right. um, and we, yeah, we'll have a, a regular show again on Friday and then mm-hmm. hopefully a return to guests next Monday because uh, Monday is usually when we have uh, the guests, but we, we flipped it uh, because you were still recovering uh, on Friday. Um, and I'm in the beginning process of reaching out to folks. Cool. Uh, Zoe Quinn of Depression Quest has already agreed to come on uh, on a certain week. Uh, so if folks have people they'd like to suggest, uh, feel free to to give me a shout, uh, and we'll we'll start reaching out to people. Um, if you have questions, jump in, throw them in the chat, uh, and I will pluck a few as we wind down the show. Hasn't been a whole lot of news, uh, but there have been a couple of a things. Couple, a couple of things uh, you mentioned, Broken Age. Yeah, I uh, got a release date uh, for for backers, which is tomorrow. Uh, State of Decay's developer, Undead Lab, signed a multi uh, year multi title agreement uh, with Microsoft Studios. Um, if people will are aware of the development history of, of of State of Decay, originally that developer was going to create an MMO uh, mm-hmm. with a zombie theme. Scrap that because it was too much for the studio up front. Um, but it has always sort of been the plan that they're going to make that afterwards. Um, don't know if that's still the plan, but uh, people seem to really like State of Decay, uh, so that seems like a good signing uh, for Microsoft. Yeah, I, I have not actually managed to ever get into State of Decay, but uh, everyone I know who has liked it has liked it a lot. So I'm, you know, I'm hopeful those guys have, you know, I, I remember what their original vision was. I remember when that studio got announced and they were talking about crazy zombie MMO stuff. And it all sounded like one of those things that was just never, ever going to come out. So I'm kind of glad they were able to, you know, sort of pivot and, you know, keep the studio going with, you know, a good, solid first project that a lot of people seem to like. Because uh, I would actually like to play the game that they had originally envisioned. It sounded pretty cool at the time. Not, and not just like, you know, like what DayZ is doing now, uh, or Rust, I guess, but, you know, Rust without zombies. Have you played yeah. Rust at all? No, apparently Brad played it on Unprofessional Fridays. Uh-huh. Uh, and you run around naked in that game, which yeah, that's pretty funny. Uh, I, you know, I it didn't sound immediately appealing to me uh, when it was described as grief the game. I understand the appeal through mm-hmm. that. Uh, right now, I've just been sort of vicariously living through others in terms of that game. Sean Elliott, uh, former uh, One Up slash Game for Windows slash Computer Gaming World editor, who's at Irrational um, as a level designer. Uh, he has been talking about his experiences on Twitter, um, and he's made that game sound... He is a notorious griefer, so mm-hmm. the fact that Sean Elliott is into that game is no big shock to me. Uh, sure. So uh, if you are interested in, sort of, like me, sort of living through others in that game, uh, I recommend following him uh, on Twitter. I think it's just at Sean Elliott. Um, 
No, I have not uh, dived into that, but I do have State of Decay invol uh, installed on my machine. I would like to try it at some point, uh, but that requires free time, and right now Spelunky and Dark Souls are kind of eating all of that up. Decaying with scoops, the next hot live stream. From there you go. Giant bomb. There you go. Uh, so there is this SimCity offline mode nonsense that has appeared yeah. this morning. Uh, only well, let's say six or seven months after anyone might have possibly cared. Uh, Maxis and EA are getting together and finally adding offline play to the game alongside uh, some, uh, I guess, somewhat restricted but still allowed uh, mod support for the game. Which I'm sitting here looking at this and going, so somebody just kind of took a look at financials and said, "All right, well, we need to find a way to try and make people play this game at least one more time before we just shutter the whole damn thing." So do this, because uh, that's the only reason I can imagine them actually going to the trouble of you know flipping the one switch they had to flip to actually make that game work offline, uh, and you know bothering to go back and basically re just right over their whole argument for that entire last year of why we couldn't do this game offline by just actually doing that. Uh, it, it doesn't make them look good, particularly even doing this now. Uh, I don't I don't think very many people are still playing that game, uh, from my understanding. Like, there are probably still some people playing that game, but not very many. So I don't really know who this is for exactly, and I don't know that this is necessarily going to rekindle the kind of interest that EA would actually want for that game. I and mean, I don't I don't know what you think about it, but it seems all kind of pointless to me. Yeah, it seems a little uh, too little, too late. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to look at it as a bad thing that it's happening. Yeah. But when taken in context of the perception of that game, the way people look at EA as a company, um, and the fact that even in the little write up. It, it doesn't really acknowledge a lot of the sh and maybe that's the right thing to do. You know, like what's the point of acknowledging the, you know, yeah. for lack of a better term, shitstorm from yeah. 2013 and just sort of moving on and saying, you know, obviously there are some people playing the game or else they wouldn't be investing resources in this at all. So maybe you know it makes more sense to try and just, you know, make those players happy and realize you've lost, you know, you've lost a lot of the mind share, but maybe there are some folks that you can make happier um, as yeah. a result. So, you know, hard, again, like I said, hard to look at it as a good thing, or as a bad thing, rather, but, you know, coming so much later is just, I don't know. It's, the game's almost a, a year weird old. thing. Yeah. It's ten months since that game came out, and that now they are doing this, uh, it, it just, I don't know, the whole thing just feels like a really strange, strangely timed move that does not necessarily benefit anyone uh, or at least in the sense that it does not benefit them in that I don't think this is going to be the thing that can't, brings people running, screaming back to that game. Right. Uh, I don't think anything is going to do that at this point. Like, they would have to make a whole new game that did not have that... those limited asses, patches of land, and fucking, you know, just none of that online stuff from the get-go uh, to, to get people interested in that stuff again, I feel like. Ah, yeah, well. Yeah, Sims well, on the plus side... Pizza Hut's Xbox 360 app made over a million dollars for the company in the first four months. Ah, good. Which is hilarious. I have not ordered a pizza through the Pizza Hut app, but I am tempted to just to say I did. And then also there's a uh, Pizza Hut head of PR. Uh, of course there is. Gave a comment to Polygon uh, where they said, uh, it's been an, a source of unbelievable growth for us. Just the explosion of people who wanted to download it, experiment it, play with Connect, uh, and you know what? That doesn't surprise me. If what drove a lot of that was people just for the novelty of it, uh, ordering a pizza through that. You know, I I know there was a similar, you know, probably not a million dollars, but when EverQuest two added slash pizza in order to order a pizza through their chat room or you know sort of interface, uh, I definitely went pretty far down the road of almost ordering a pizza through that. And, uh, yeah, you can get gamers to do gimmicky things. That's not... It's that's not hard. Not shock. No. Um, Jazz Punk, coming out February 7th. My Very birthday. Much that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Necrophone Games. That's for awesome. The, the wonderful birthday present. Uh, looking forward to playing that. People should look that up if they are not aware of the weirdness of Jazz Punk. Oh, God. That trailer that I put up a while ago pretty much says it all. Check that out. Uh, that's kind of all I had for news, really. Uh, I will I will mention, uh, give a, a quick plug and a uh, 
an applause to the awesome games done quick, which topped a mm. million dollars uh, in in the last 24 hours. Uh, it might be actually 48 hours at this point since the news came out. Uh, but they had a huge hundred thousand dollar surge at the very end of there. Uh, awesome games done quick was a uh, a week long uh, Twitch stream in which they were had a bunch of speedrunners uh, playing through games and breaking them and trying to break uh, their their high scores and it was really cool to watch. I watched a good chunk of the uh, uh, the Yoshi's Island one, which was mm-hmm. incredible to watch someone play that uh, with a high level of play. It just requires such precision and you know the fact that uh, they raised a bunch of money for cancer research and uh, the giant bomb. Uh, community managed to raise enough money uh, to have uh, the robot in the game uh, named after Ryan, uh, which was a, a really, really cool moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I, I feel like I can't speak on it too long before it'll mess me up, but that was really cool of you guys to, to come together and do that. So, totally. Um, bravo. And they also got the ship named uh, Tupac, which. Nice. Is, which was also from uh, the endurance run that uh, Ryan and I did. So, Good on you guys. Uh, that was a really cool uh, thing to, to see and hear over the weekend. Um, did you see uh-huh. the guy playing Mike Tyson's Punch-Out blindfolded? No. No, I did not. Was he playing it based, uh, purely based on sound effects? Yes. Yes. It was all uh, just remembered timing and sound effects, and uh, he got all the way to Mike Tyson before he lost. Man, uh, that's, that's pretty incredible. I also saw the uh, they did something. They had uh, occasional mystery games. Um, yeah. which is where were surprises for the audience. Um, and one of them was the mask for the mm-hmm. uh, for the SNES. And they had the lead designer of the game on there. And oh, no way. It was, it was incredible to watch the designer react to his game get broken in all sorts of crazy ways that he was completely unaware of. Crazy. I forgot that game even existed. I imagine a lot of people did. That That is pretty rad. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, oh, okay, people asked about SimCity. We already, already got over that. Uh, development asked, Patrick, why'd you get hit by the spikes? Screw you. you I won't. mean, it's a fair question. Yep, yep. Uh, people mentioning awesome games done quick. Uh, oh, people mentioning uh, that there is an escape room in Chicago. So okay, I, I have clicked the link for that, and I will, I will remember that for. Uh, Home Escape Adventures. Hmm. Getting locked in a room. Best date, best date night ever, says Rosie Roberts on the website. Ooh. That's a little creepy. Iza Pziza. I don't know if I pronounced that right. What do you guys think of Republic? I don't know. I haven't played it yet. I'm saving that game uh, for some sort of plane flight at some point. Yeah. I have that downloaded uh, next to a bunch of other iPad games that I've been meaning to play. I did finally play some Device 6. That game is cool. Game yeah, is you should see that all the way to the end. The ending in that game is fantastic. I and... will, eventually. I just died. Again, I mostly excised any sort of video game playing from my schedule, while I was, mostly while I was traveling, but also even when I came home, just because I needed a little bit of a break. But I did spend some time playing that, and I really like that game. That, is, that game is really cool. Yeah, yeah. It's not too long, either. I'd say maybe three hours. Uh, yeah. I'll hold um, but it is a nice game to take a break from. You solve a puzzle, you know, or, or a section, and then you move yeah. on to the next one. Um, it's not really a game that you can jump back into mid-chapter because a lot of the puzzle solving is predicated on you starting at the beginning of that chapter and seeing it through. So you kind of uh, need to do those uh, all at once. Uh, Hippocrat O asking, thoughts on PlayStation Now? I'm not sure if you saw the announcement from CES about that. Did you? I did not. Okay, PlayStation Now is basically the Gaikai stuff. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did see that. Sorry. Okay. I, I, a... For some reason, brain fart. But yes, I saw that whole thing. Yeah, so if you aren't aware, they're rolling out a beta of PlayStation Now later this month uh, in North America, um, and there will be uh, an official rollout in the summer. They have said that it may come much later to Europe due to bandwidth concerns, um, largely because... Uh, things are uh, a little more scattered and mm-hmm. less standardized in Europe, so there are some things they have to work out there before they can commit to rolling it out uh, in, in Europe. But, uh, yeah, you know, PlayStation Now, theoretically, sounds pretty cool. It does. Um, but it's hard to know or say much about it till we've had a chance to 
uh, play with it in our own hands. And although uh, the reports out of CES from folks that uh, managed to play some games there uh, are really encouraging, it was definitely working there very well. Uh, you know, the, the the responses seem to to range from just a tiny amount of lag in compression uh, to uh, works flawlessly, uh, mm-hmm. which is a, an encouraging early development. But so much of make, what makes that service work is going to be based on how it works in your place and how far you are from the servers. And there are all sorts of weird scenarios that are going to come up for that service, which is why they're running you know a beta test in January. But I hope it works as well as was reported because that would be really damn cool. Yeah. Um, but hard to say too much about that service until you know I'm actually playing with it in in my house. I think I'm finally trained uh, to the point where I it used to be that anytime anyone announced a service like this, I would just be like, "That sounds great. I'm really excited about it." And then it would end up never working correctly, and I would just get really sad. So I think I finally trained my brain to react accordingly to news announcements like this and go, "Yeah, that sounds great, but." the internet is not really built for what they're talking about yet, at least not consumer-grade internet for most people. Uh, And so that and the the WWE Network announcements both have left me going, yes, this sounds like really terrific ideas. I am super on board with the the concepts behind them. I have, like, this much faith that they will actually work as intended uh, for at least the first year. Uh, because, you know, Sony has obviously had its issues with PlayStation Network working correctly over the years, and I realize this is, like, a slightly different thing, and this is not, you know, predicated on those exact same servers doing the same things, but, like, I still don't trust a widespread game streaming service to actually work on American consumer Internet uh, correctly for a good long while. Similarly, the WWE has had apparently not been super great as far as, like, their uh, pay-per-view streaming and other things... Uh, you know, in, in previous iterations, so I am not convinced that that thing is going to work exactly the way everyone says it's going to. Uh, I wish I was not this cynical. These sound like really exciting, awesome things, but I am also sitting here going, yeah, I'm going to put money into them inevitably, but boy, I'm gonna, it's going to really suck when these things don't work. Yeah, and I'm definitely curious to see how they approach uh, how people access the service. You know, uh, when I inquired about whether this was uh, a service that will be, because it's going to be subscription based, or you can rent yeah. it on a per title basis. Uh, whether this is going to be rolled into your PlayStation Plus account or as a separate subscription, I expect it will be a separate subscription, but the caveat there being my guess is that PlayStation Plus owners get, on a per title basis, access to some games on the PlayStation Now service in the same way that you get an instant game collection. Uh, my guess is that Sony will say, like, hey, this month you can get you know, redeem to get access to uh, Final Fantasy VII on PlayStation Now uh, for your, you know, Vita and PlayStation 4, um, and I guess Bravia TVs because they're going to roll it out to non-PlayStation devices. Uh, but my guess is if you want the full-on subscription service, uh, you're going to have to pay an additional fee, which seems, I think, completely reasonable. I don't think that's even a thing to get yeah. upset about. Like, the it's a separate infrastructure, it's a separate kind of service, um, and if they make it compelling enough, then... You know, I, I think they're they'll be justified, but I think a lot of that's gonna be predicated on them getting third parties on board, uh, because I don't think Sony has enough of a first party library that I would mm-hmm. want to sign up for a subscription service, and instead I would probably want to play on a on a per title basis. Uh, but yeah. we'll see we'll see what the li- the the, ti- the 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 title library is for that stuff. There's just kind of you know a lot of details we don't know about. Uh, but for you know for like a game like Journey, you know something that isn't Twitch based. You know, I'm probably willing to put up with a significant amount of, or at least you know, a decent amount of lag because it's just it probably won't impact that experience uh, too much. Uh, yeah, but we'll see. Um, I want it all to work. That's a, that, yeah. that's what I will say is that I want this all to work because this all sounds great and I'm I'm super into the idea of it. Uh, it will definitely negate some of the sour grapes that some had about the whole you know lack of back- backward compatibility stuff on on the PS4 um, not all of it but some of it at least so I'm Godspeed to Sony on that one yeah absolutely and with that I think that is going to bring uh, the first real mom in the am with scoops in the wolf to a close Alex it is it is good to have you back it's uh, great it to be back good to be back in the rhythm of things uh, totally. like I said if uh, people have guest suggestions, feel free to shoot them over to me as I start uh, reaching out to folks and scheduling out our Mondays uh, prior to when we'll have convention season. 
kicking uh, back into gear a little bit. With uh, It's happening later this year. GDC and PAX East are much later than they were uh, in years prior. GDC is not till late March, and uh, PAX East is not till early April. So we've got some time before all of that starts going. But um, that'll do it for, for me and you for, for Monday. Uh, it's 10.37, so I'm not sure if I'm going to hit my 11 a.m. start time for Spelunky, but I would like to so that I can get over to uh, the Cards Against Humanity office today. So uh, maybe I will try and do Spelunky at 11.15 or 11.30 so I can go eat something really quick. But uh, Alex, what are, you, what are you up to this week? You're just getting back into the rhythm of things? You got any anything on your plate? Yeah, nothing really on my plate at the moment. Um, I'll probably uh, start trying to fuddle, futz around with some video things that I had left by the wayside before the break uh, and the, the deluge of Game of the Year stuff hit. Uh, other than that, yeah, just uh, getting ready for Friday's show and doing some other stuff here and there. Cool. All right, Alex, I will talk to you again on Friday. Later on. Ow.